going to be tax associates with uh, complex tax structures. And our presenter here today will be Kim, and she can take it from here. Thank you, Kim. All right, perfect, Sean. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, it's always a bit of a risk to do a webinar, especially a tax webinar on a beautiful sunny day in August, um, especially for those of us in the upper Midwest when we know how short our summers can be. So I do appreciate people joining me here today. Hopefully we can um, cover, get through some of these topics and um, enlighten you a little bit on the tax risks um, that we're gonna talk about. So with that, um, we will start off with our agenda. So we're gonna touch on today, the topics um, really are with respect to some of the more complex types of organizational structures that organizations might be looking at. And in most of these, I'm gonna be assuming um, within the healthcare systems that the parent entity is an exempt organization. Now that's not um, going to be critical in this, but you know, if you're, a, if you're in a situation where you're a taxable entity, um, for the most part, all of these same rules are gonna apply. Um, there's a section where I'll be talking about kind of the impact on the exempt parent. So obviously that would be a little bit different. Um, but we'll be talking about different considerations when you're thinking about setting up subsidiary type entities and um, the things that you need to be thinking about. We'll also talk about alternative investments. This is um, an area that we are seeing more and more organizations entering into. And while alternative investments can be great, they can provide a completely different um, type of investment vehicle with a little more, little more risk, a little more return. Um, there are some tax considerations that need to be thought of when you're entering into these types of investments. And this would be the same whether you're um, investing at an exempt entity level or a for-profit entity level, you have the exact same risks. We're then gonna talk about unrelated business income. Um, primarily because there are some changes in the rules with respect to unrelated business income. And these rules really kind of flow throughout um, the discussion we'll have on the subsidiary entities and the alternative investments. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with just a few updates on um, some current events, um, especially with respect to the CARES Act and COVID legislation, it just seems like, um, any webinar today wouldn't be official without having the word COVID in it. So we will at least um, touch for a few minutes on some, some things with respect to COVID legislation. So with that, um, if you have questions as I go throughout, please feel free to use the chat function or the question and answer function. Um, I probably at this point will wait and take those questions at the end. Um, just to ensure we get through all of the materials. So with that, we will jump into subsidiary entities. So we're seeing more and more organizations looking at the opportunity to, to create subsidiary entities. And there's a lot of different reasons that this could happen. So one of the primary things that we'll see is when you have an exempt organization, they may look at setting up some other type of entity to protect their own tax exempt status. And when I talk about this, it's really thinking about if there's activities that they want to conduct that could um, jeopardize that tax exempt status. So it could be something that's unrelated to their exempt purpose, um, the concept of unrelated business income, if an organization's conducting too much unrelated business income, they can jeopardize their tax exempt status. Other situations um, that could impact tax exempt status would be conducting lobbying activities or having political activities. Um, some of those types of things could 
result in thinking maybe this is something that should go into a different entity, not my exempt entity. It could also be to reduce exposure to liability. So maybe your organization is looking at um, getting into some research or some other type of product development that you don't know what's going to happen with it. And instead of jeopardizing the assets of the exempt organization, you can reduce the exposure by putting that activity into a, di a different entity. And we'll talk a little bit about what types of entities are best for limiting that exposure. Maybe you wanna attract outside investors. So um, again, maybe your organization is looking at some type of um, product that you're developing and maybe you think, this is something that we could get other people interested in and we could get capital from other investors. In that case, you, you're not gonna want it in your exempt organization um, because you can't have investors within an exempt entity. So there may be a benefit of dropping it down into a different type of entity. Compensation options. So exempt organizations have limitations on the types of compensation arrangements they can have. Um, and sometimes we will see that there's some opportunities to set up different types of structures where you can provide different types of compensation. So for instance, you, if you were using a taxable corporation, within that entity, you could do something like stock, um, stock purchase options, you could do some revenue sharing agreements, um, so things that you couldn't otherwise do within the exempt organization. There's still, because of some of the related organization rules when it comes to compensation, you still could be subject to some of the restrictions within the exempt organization world, but there are more options um, with especially taxable corporations. Maybe there's some operational considerations. Um, you decide, you know, we're really strong at, at doing hospitals within um, our normal entity, but if we're gonna venture into maybe doing um, nursing homes, maybe we wanna put that into a separate entity, or we're gonna start to look into different senior living options. Um, and we wanna keep those separate so that we can have really separate lines of businesses. Or governance considerations, maybe, um, you're looking at acquiring some hospitals in different locations and you want to have local boards um, that can still have a say in some of the operations and having those as separate entities might make sense. So lots of different reasons to think about this and now we'll jump into what some of those entities might look like and some of the considerations that you should keep in mind. So we're gonna start out with partnerships. So a partnership, um, in order to have a partnership, you have to have more than one entity. So it's typically gonna be two or more um, partners that come together, they form an entity, and both of those partners, and I'm gonna probably for the sake of ease, just talk about a two partner partnership, but you can have multiple, up to hundreds of partners. Um, you, you put, you're gonna both put assets or some type of capital into that partnership and in exchange, you take an interest in the partnership. Now there's two different types of partnerships. One is a general partnership. And in that situation, all of the partners are general partners and all the partners are personally liable for the partnership's debts. So if, they're, um, if the partnership takes out debt in order to conduct its activities, the partners themselves are gonna be personally liable for that. If the partnership you know, generates losses and at the end of the day um, needs more capital, both of the partners are gonna be re required to put more capital into that partnership. Um, a partnership for tax purposes, the income flows through to the owners and, the, and is taxed at the partner level. So a partnership is not a tax paying entity. Um, instead, each of those partners is gonna pay tax and you actually would look at the um, different sources of income 
and treat those according to the type of source of income. And this does avoid the double level of taxation, which is what we'll talk about when we talk about a corporation. Um, within a corporation, that is a separate tax paying entity. So in general, the corporation is gonna pay tax. And then when it distributes income out to its owners, the owners pay tax on that income distribution in general. Um, a limited partner, similar to a general partnership in the structure and the operation. However, within a limited partnership, you can have both limited partners and general partners. You have to have at least one general partner and that general partner has unlimited personal liability for the partnership debts. Whereas the limited partners do get some legal um, liability protection and their liability is limited to their investment in the company unless they're part of management. If they're part of management, then they also have that unlimited personal liability. So this is an opportunity, you know, depending on the type of activity that you're looking at, this is an opportunity for um, the organization to both limit its liability, if you set up a limited partnership, and um, end up avoiding that double level of taxation. All right, let's contrast that then with a corporation. So a corporation is gonna provide complete legal protection to the shareholders, um, limited though, I should, so I shouldn't say complete, it's gonna provide limited protection to the shareholders and that is limited to their direct investment in the corporation. So if you think about um, if you were to go out and purchase stock of a corporation, your investment is whatever you put into that corporation. And if at the end of the day, the corporation goes out of business, you only lose your investment. You're not, you don't have to put more money in to cover the, the losses of the corporation. So um, this is one of the benefits that you get with a corporation over a partnership. Um, a corporation, there's pretty easy transferability of ownership. Again, think about a publicly traded company that has stock being traded on the um, stock exchange. Very easy to um, change the ownerships because there's shares um, of the corporation. Whereas with a partnership, you identify who the partners are and changes in those partnerships require rewriting that agreement. A corporation can have an unlimited life, can go on forever with new um, partners joining and, and leaving, um, but it is subject to very specific legal formalities. So you organize a corporation by um, filing articles of incorporation with the state in which you're located in, any changes to the organizing documents have to go through that it's typically the Secretary of State. Um, you, the organization will have separate bylaws, which are the organizing um, or the operating documents of how the organization is gonna be structured and operated. Um, and you are required to have a board of directors um, for this type of entity, and you're required to have meetings. So it, there's a much more formal structure involved. As I mentioned earlier, a corporation is treated as a tax paying entity. So they're gonna pay corporate level taxes on all of their activities. Um, you know, that corporate level tax being currently the 21% flat tax. Um, a, and in this case, I'm when I talk about a corporation, these are gonna be stock corporations. So if you went to the Secretary of State and you wanted to incorporate um, you typically are going to incorporate as a stock corporation. In other words, there's stock that's issued. Stock corporations are not allowed to apply for tax exempt status. Um, so these entities are gonna be taxable entities. So sometimes you might hear me use the phrase taxable corporation versus just corporation. Um, so that's a, just a distinction there. And then, like I mentioned before, the income 
can be distributed to the owners via dividend distributions. So those dividends are paid out to the owners and then depending on the tax status of the owner, they would also pay tax on those dividend distributions. All right, the next type that we're gonna talk about another type of corporation, but this is gonna be a nonprofit corporation. So the nonprofit or some, some states will call them non-stock corporations. So these are um, the typical type of organizations that we think of when we talk about tax exempt entities. Um, I always say nonprofit is a legal term. That's not an operating model. So that doesn't mean that just because these entities are nonprofit that they can't generate profits, they should generate profits. Um, but instead, what it means is that the, the primary purpose for this organization is not to generate income for its shareholders. Um, nonprofit corporations don't have owners. Some states, you can have them set up so that they have members. Um, that member may be another um, nonprofit corporation. It could be a governmental entity. Sometimes we'll see members being individuals. Um, some hospitals that I see will have members be anyone who's made a contribution of $100 to the organization can be a member. And then the, within your organizing documents, you lay out the rights of those members. So sometimes the right of the member is to appoint, is to elect the board members. Um, sometimes the member can have other types of rights with respect to the um, changes that they have to approve um, within this organization. Similar to a, for, for, to a um, stock corporation, a nonprofit corporation does provide for protection of assets because it is a separate legal entity. Um, and nonprofit corporations can apply for tax exempt status. So if, um, if I'm working with an organization that's thinking about wanting to set up a new entity and um, they have an activity that is, could qualify for tax exempt purposes, um, they would want to set up a nonprofit corporation to give them that opportunity. However, if a nonprofit corporation is set up, it's considered to be a taxable corporation for IRS purposes unless you apply for tax exempt status. So that's often a, a confusion to people is I can have a stock corporation and a nonprofit corporation and they both can be subject to tax. It's that application for tax exempt status that gets the nonprofit corporation to be tax exempt. Um, so just because you have a nonprofit corporation, don't automatically assume that it's a tax exempt entity. All right, the next kind of structure is a limited liability corporation. And a limited liability corporation, um, these haven't been around as long as partnerships and corporations, but they're really kind of a hybrid between the two type, between partnerships and corporations. So a limited liability corporation, um, because it has the term limited liability, it's probably clear that the liabil legal liability is in limited to your investment in the company. Um, so similar to a stock corporation, it's limited to what you've invested in the company. Um, these types of entities can allow for outside members. Um, they're very flexible. So a limited liability corporation only requires that there's an, organ an operating agreement that outlines the expectations of the managers, outlines general governance considerations. Um, most state laws allow for very loose operating structures with respect to these types of corporations. They're not nearly as restrictive as setting up an actual corporation. Um, limited liability corporations can actually apply for tax exempt status. 
However, in order to do that, certain conditions have to be met within um, the original articles or original operating agreement. So, and some of those seem pretty straightforward, but it would require that all of the members of this corporation have to be 501c3 organizations. You have to have provisions in place for what would happen if a member lost its tax exempt status. Um, basically saying if a member no longer is a tax exempt entity, they would themselves then no longer be able to be a member of the corporation. Um, you have to limit the activities specifically in the operating agreement. You have to say that the activities can only be activities that would meet the definition of a tax exempt entity and that upon dissolution, all of the assets would go to a tax exempt entity. So those are the same types of restrictions that are required um, for any type of entity to meet tax exempt status under 501c3. So um, this then is another good option if you have an entity that wants to think about setting up a new entity that may sometime in the future want to be treated as tax exempt, um, this gives you that flexibility. Now, within a limited liability corporation, you can have single member or you can have multiple members. So you could set this up and have one member that owns 100% of the membership interests. And if that's the case, and that's what I would call a single member LLC, in that case, there's actually two different treatments that you can choose. So the default treatment for a single member LLC is actually that it's a disregarded entity. So it has no tax um, presence from an IRS standpoint. Typically you would register it with the IRS. So it has an EIN number but it doesn't become a tax paying entity. Instead, it's really um, treated as if it's a department of the parent entity. If instead you wanted that to be treated as a taxable corporation, there's an election that can be made. It's the check called the check the box election. And then you can choose to treat it as a taxable corporation for tax purposes. So there's some planning that can happen here with respect to how you want to do that. And you can make that change at any time. Now, in contrast, if I have multiple members within my LLC structure, again, there's two different ways it can be treated. It can either be treated as a partnership or as a corporate or as a taxable corporation. So the default is that it's gonna be treated as a partnership. In other words, the income is gonna flow through to my partner or to my members, similar to what a partnership would be. Or you can make the election to be treated as a corporation and have that as a separate tax paying entity. So I, I think that we see more and more of the limited liability corporations being used um, just because there is so much flexibility with respect to um, being able to add members, being able to kind of change the operations and the structure as it um, is needed for the organization and that ability to you know, maybe you start out with just one member and then in the future you add additional members. Um, you, you know, the ability to treat it as a disregarded entity or as a taxable corporation or as a partnership, depending on what seems to fit best for your organizational structure. So here's where I'm going to talk about the impact on the exempt status of the parent. So in this situation, you know, assuming that I have a parent entity that has one of these or multiple of these structures underneath it, um, there could be an impact on the tax exempt status of the parent entity. So we're going to start with taxable corporations single member LLCs or multiple member LLCs that are treated as corporations. Um, 
these types of entities are not going to have any impact on the tax exempt status of the of the parent entity. So the benefit with these is it really kind of puts a, a line between the exempt parent and the taxable corporation. So the activities that are generated down there are not attributed up to the exempt parent. The tax exempt status is protected. Um, however, certain transactions that are uh, that occur between the exempt parent and the taxable corporation can result in tax at the parent level. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, um, but there's some some rules that the IRS put in place in with the intent that you can't. Um, transfer tax liability between these related entities. If the parent entity is exempt and they have a subsidiary entity that it's exempt, again, the activities are not going to be attributable to the exempt parent. So again, there's kind of that line between the two. Um, each organization is going to file a separate tax return. So it's um, different than the rules within the taxable corporation world where um, if I had a taxable parent and I had a wholly owned taxable subsidiary, I can file one tax return, a consolidated tax return to account for both of those entities. Uh, there's no provisions for filing a consolidated 990. Um, so each entity is gonna file their own tax return. And again, certain transactions can result in unrelated business income here. And then if I have a single member LLC that's disregarded for tax purposes, now here, all of the activities that are conducted within that entity are gonna be considered as conducted by the exempt organization and they're gonna be reported as such. So if my single member LLC is um, conducting an activity that would be unrelated to my tax exempt purpose, that's gonna result in unrelated business income. If my single member LLC starts doing some political or lobbying activities, those are gonna be attributed to the parent and could jeopardize exempt status. Um, a single member LLC that's disregarded is not required to obtain tax exempt status. So they get the benefits of tax exempt status without having to actually fill out an exemption application and they are eligible for charitable contributions directly to that entity. So there's, um, there is a revenue um, ruling or a notice that came out that, that does clarify that, that indicates that that entity, even though they don't formally have tax exempt status, they can use the tax exempt status of the parent to get charitable contributions. Then if we think about a partnership, or a multiple member LLC that's treated as a partnership. In this case, the activities of that that are conducted in that partnership are going to be attributed to the exempt parent. So we need to consider that when we think about whether there's unrelated business income at the exempt parent's level and whether there's any impact on tax exempt status. So again, lobbying or political, or if that income from the partnership is gonna generate tax um, unrelated business income. Um, if an or exempt organization has substantial unrelated business income, that could be a jeopardy to their tax exempt status. We also need to ensure in situations where there's non-exempt partners and our parent is the general partner or the managing member, that we aren't putting the exempt organization's assets at risk by being in that partnership. So if you think about it, if I have a exempt entity that is the general partner, so they have full liability um, responsibilities, and then we have um, other, other taxable entities or non-exempt people, entities, that are limited partners, so their, their responsibility is limited. If there was some kind of a blowout, 
all of those assets of the exempt organization could be at risk. And that can jeopardize the exempt status. So basically you're saying you could end up using those assets and there's a benefit that's being given to those non-exempt um, partners. So in this case, if you're entering into a partnership with non-exempt partners, there's a requirement that the exempt organization has sufficient control to ensure that the exempt purposes are going to continue to be met and that any private interests are going to be incidental. So the IRS has put out a, um, a number of, guide, of pieces of guidance with respect to how they want to see these types of transactions structured. Um, so if you are looking at entering into partnerships or um, LLCs with for-profit entities and you as the exempt entity are going to be the general partner, a managing member, you need to make sure that those provisions are in your operating agreement. Okay, I mentioned earlier that payments between taxable entities or even exempt entities could result in unrelated business income to the parent entity. And these, this can happen with respect to passive payments that are going between the two entities. So unrelated business income, um, there's an exception to the unrelated business income rules for certain types of passive income. So interest, annuities, royalties, and rents um, that basically say in general terms that those types of revenue streams are not going to be treated as taxable to exempt organizations. However, the IRS looked at this and said, well, here's an opportunity for abuse. So let's use an example of rent. Let's say that the exempt parent owns a, owns a building and they rent space to their taxable entity. Um, so they're charging, let's say they, they decide to charge $50,000 per year for rent. So under my normal rules, the rental income would be excluded from the exempt parents' books. Well, it would be included for book purposes, but it wouldn't be taxable income. And my taxable subsidiary gets to take a deduction of $50,000, um, which, which probably seems pretty realistic. That might be a fair market value of rent, and they would have otherwise had to take that rental deduction. But what if instead we now say, well, here's an opportunity to reduce our taxable subsidiary's tax liability. And instead of charging 50,000, we charge 250,000. So again, without this controlled payment rule, my exempt entity doesn't pick up any income. My taxable entity, instead of paying fair market value rent of 50,000, they actually can charge 200, they take $250,000 deduction. They reduce their taxable income by that $250,000 and they're at the end of the day money ahead because they haven't paid as much tax. And as a whole, um, you know, my group is money ahead. So the IRS looked at this and said, that doesn't make sense. We can't have that in place. So what they've said is to the extent that an exempt entity is receiving interest annuities, royalties, or rents from a controlled entity, they need to pick that up as unrelated business income. And there's, there's two pieces here. First, that that payment is decreasing net unrelated business income of the controlled entity. So if it's an exempt subsidiary and that rent is being used to reduce UBI at the exempt subsidiary, then that this payment would fall under these rules. Or if it's a taxable subsidiary, in that case, you look at the activities of that taxable subsidiary and determine if those activities would be UBI if the entity were exempt and had the same purpose as the parent. Um, if either of those are the case, then they are subject to these rules, but it only applies to the amount in excess of fair market value. So they recognize that in my example, the $50,000 
is reasonable. That's fair market value rent. In my example, this rule would apply to that $200,000 difference. So the exempt entity would pay tax at the same rate, so the 21% rate, and my taxable subsidiary would take a deduction and they re reduce their tax by a taxable income by that 200,000. You'll note this doesn't apply to dividends because the subsidiary entity doesn't receive a deduction for dividends paid. So if a taxable subsidiary is declaring a dividend and makes dividend payments up to its exempt entity, there's no tax impact on that. And for this purpose, controls defined as owning or controlling more than 50% of the vote or the value of the related organization. And that can be direct or indirect. So um, you do have to look through all of your entities um, from an indirect standpoint. There are some state tax issues to consider in your structuring. So from a sales tax standpoint, there's exemptions for sales tax that exist for certain types of entities and certain types of transactions. Um, if you have an exempt organization that's getting exemptions from sales tax, you can't use those exemptions for your taxable subsidiaries. Um, so you have to look at a state by state basis to figure out, well, which entities are exempt and for what types of activities and if those if you are purchasing um, supplies that are going to be used in an entity that's not tax exempt, those are still going to be subject to sales tax. Um, the other place that I've seen organizations have issues here is a single member LLC. We've said that's disregarded for federal tax purposes. It's not necessarily disregarded for state tax purposes. So some single member LLCs may not be exempt from sales tax, even though the parent is exempt, and they may not even be exempt from, fed, or from income tax, even though the parent is exempt. Um, so that's a really key thing to understand within your state, um, how the state looks at single member LLCs. And then from property tax, again, there's exemptions that are provided to exempt entities that typically are not going to apply to your subsidiary entities. So thinking about taking activities that are conducted within your exempt entity and moving it down to a taxable subsidiary could, while it will result in um, federal and state income tax, it also could result in property tax and sales tax. Um, from a capitalization standpoint, really the thing I wanted to note here is, you know, the benefit of setting up an exempt entity is that you can get charitable contributions. You can also get contributed capital from the parent. Um, both taxable corporations and exempt entities can have loans um, from the parent down to the taxable corporation. It's just that that interest could be subject to the 512B13 rules that we just discussed. And anytime you have transactions between your exempt and your taxables, you need to make sure that they're at fair market value. From a liquidation standpoint, um, key thing to know here is when you have a taxable corporation, and let's say you have a taxable corporation and you decide that you want to liquidate that entity up into your exempt organization. That complete liquidation is going to be a taxable event. Um, so the IRS has said you can't take assets out of the taxable world and convert them into the exempt world without paying a tax um, on those assets. And that tax really is based as if those assets were sold at fair market value. Um, so at, in that case, it's required that you would get a valuation, figure out what fair market value is, compare that to your tax basis, and pay a tax on that, ta on that um, gain. From an exempt entity, those are typically structured that they're required to distribute to another exempt entity. So in that case, you know, that liquidation is a pretty easy transaction. Um, same with a partnership. Partnership liquidations can result default when you have a change in your partners. 
typically it's not going to be a taxable event, but there can be situations where it will be. And then just key things to think about here when you do have these different entities, it's really important to maintain separateness. So making sure, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but some key things, making sure your transactions are being conducted at arm's length, especially when you have transactions between exempts and for-profit entities. Um, making sure you're maintaining separate books and records, separate bank accounts, um, avoiding 100% overlap of boards. I do see this more when you have two exempt entities, but for sure if you have for-profits, the IRS likes to see that you've got two, that you've got separate boards. You can have some overlap and that's typically gonna happen, but not 100% overlap. Making sure your organizations are actually having board meetings and keeping separate minutes. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, these couple of people are gonna leave the room, we're gonna have a quick board meeting for the subsidiary, and then we're gonna resume our parent entity board meeting. Um, if you have administrative services or any other types of relationships that are happening between your entities, getting those documented and written policies is really important and having written agreements in place um, just to help secure um, the deductions that you might be taking at a taxable entity. And then just some key other considerations. Um, on a, from a Form 990 standpoint, at all related organizations are going to be disclosed. So you, if you set up any of these subsidiary entities, um, they're going to end up getting disclosed for sure on the parent's return, but possibly on the returns of all of the other subsidiary entities also. And that reporting is based on control. And then the compensation that's paid by the exempt organization and all of its related organizations is also gonna be reported on the 990, which is publicly available. So some organizations sometimes think, well, if I put my executives into a taxable corporation, that return isn't subject to public disclosure. Therefore, you know, I can keep that compensation out of the view of the public. Um, the IRS got smart to get that years ago, and they now require that the related organization compensation is also disclosed. Um, from a I already mentioned taxable corporations aren't subject to the intermediate sanctions rules, and they do have an ability to pay compensation um, in different ways. Um, the last thing to note is if you have tax exempt bonds and you have a taxable corporation, is using some of those assets that were financed by the bonds, you are gonna end up with private business use. So we have our first polling question. So true or false, with relationships between entities, it's important to maintain separateness of the organizations. All right, wow, everyone got that one correct, so 100%. All right, then we are gonna move on to alternative investments. So we are seeing, um, as I mentioned, more and more organizations that are looking at alternative investments. You know, and these are gonna be investments that aren't your normal, um, that aren't just cash or stocks and bonds, but instead these are ones that have uh, lack of liquidity. Um, they're usually harder to exit from, higher risk, higher reward, so they tend to, um, organizations might enter into them with the understanding that there's um, potential for greater return on investment. And these valuations tend to be subjective. So the types of things we're thinking about here are limited partnerships, our limited liability companies, and hedge funds. Um, we already talked a lot about um, the limited partnerships, limited liabilities. In this situation, the organization will receive a K-1, um, which is a tax form from the partnership that's gonna detail out the organization's share of the income and loss um, components, and oftentimes has a lot more information that has to be um, analyzed to determine if there's other tax filings that are required. 
Hedge funds um, become a little more challenging. We can see both domestic and foreign hedge funds. Where we see the most complexity is with respect to foreign hedge funds, because these are typically foreign corporations that you are investing in. And once an organization is investing in foreign corporations or foreign partnerships for that matter, there's additional um, reporting that has to be done to the IRS um, just with respect to them wanting to understand when money is leaving the U.S. and going into foreign um, entities. So the key things that we have to consider here is unrelated business income. And this is especially true when, you're, when we're talking about partnerships and other types of flow through entities. We mentioned before, you're gonna pick up the allocable share of all of the income and have to analyze that to see whether it's subject to UBI or not. So the same rules we apply with respect to interest, dividends, rental income, um, those are ex excluded from UBI, but if there's ordinary income that's generated within the partnership, we have to look at that ordinary income as if the part, as if the exempt organization or the taxable corporation generated it themselves. Um, we also can have foreign filing obligations. So this can happen either directly because we own um, a direct interest in a foreign corporation or foreign partnership, or in the case where we're investing in a US partnership, that partnership might invest in a foreign corporation. And then we have to look through and look at our share of the foreign activity and determine if there's filings required. So types of foreign forms that might be required. Um, a form 926 is required when a U.S. entity transfers more than $100,000 to a, a corporation in exchange for stock in that corporation, and this would be to a foreign corporation, um, or transfers of any other type of property in exchange for stock. So um, we often are seeing this with our hedge funds, with our initial investments into hedge funds or additional investments in hedge funds, or we see these on flowing through on our K-1s from um, domestic partnerships. An 8865 is very similar, but this is with respect to transactions with foreign partnerships. And these are triggered if you own more than 10% of the foreign partnership, or you contributed more than $100,000. A Form 5471 is required when you own over 10% of a foreign corporation. We don't see these too often, um, but once in a while those, those are required. In 8621, this is an information return if you are invested in a passive foreign investment company, a PFIC, um, which is an entity that gets more than 75% of its income from investment type income. These forms typically are going to be filed by the partnership if you are investing through a partnership um, and are only required to be filed by an exempt organization if the PFIC itself is generating unrelated business income. Um, an 8886 is a reportable transaction disclosure. This is actually not a foreign form. Um, but it's a form that's required if you have certain types of transactions that the IRS has interest in. And we see these um, for 988 loss transactions. And then there is the FBAR reporting, which happens if you have foreign bank accounts. The penalties on these are extremely high. Um, so it's very important to get these forms filed. I'm not going to go through them all, but let's just suffice it to say that some of these penalties can up, be up to $100,000 per year. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're looking at your investments and understanding what you have. And then what to do if a form is missed. So we know that this is happening. And I would say investment advisors are getting better at giving out this information to file these forms. So in the past, it was not as easy to know sometimes whether these forms are required. 
if you do have if you do become aware that you missed filing a form recommendation is to come clean so file an amended return submit the form get it in and there's a streamlined compliance process that allows for you to file the return submit a reasonable cause statement as long as you're not currently under exam by the irs and the irs and hasn't contacted you with respect to the form they typically are not going to assess the penalties if you if you proactively let them know that you've become aware of it so that would be my recommendation is you know if you know that you have these issues clean them up and get them filed so as you think about new alternative investments you know make sure whoever's responsible for your tax compliance knows when you're entering into new alternative investments so they can consider what the tax ramifications are going to be um, make sure you understand whether there's going to be unrelated business income triggered on alternative investments because that is a cost of that investment um, so they could promise you a great return but if that great return is subject to tax, you have to take the tax cost into consideration. Um, as for the prospectus or financial statements, that does help us to understand the nature of the investments. And then just make sure that information is gonna be available to do the analysis. Um, like I said, I think most investment advisors that work with exempt organizations are getting better at understanding the information that's needed. Um, but we often are having to contact um, partnerships directly to try to get information to determine what the tax treatment is going to be for our exempt organizations. All right, we have our next polling question. What's our penalty for failing to file? A, 100,000 per form, B, 10,000 per form, or C, it depends on the form. And we're a little bit more split on this one, but I would say C depends on the form. A lot of them are the maximum is 10,000 and it may start at 10, or I'm sorry, the maximum is 100,000. They may start at 10,000. All right. And now we're going to start, start on unrelated business income. So our siloing, this is a new term doesn't come up, you know, it still comes up as a um, misspelled word. So it's not a commonly used term other, outside of exempt organizations. Um, but the siloing rules came into play with the Tax uh, Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. Um, sometimes it's hard for me to believe that we've actually been talking about this for two and a, two and a half years, but we have. Um, and really what the siloing rules do is for an organization that has unrelated business income, before these rules came into play, you would look at all of your different activities from unrelated activities and you could net them all together and you'd come up with a net unrelated business income. The siloing rules say an organization has to bifurcate their activities into different silos or different trades or businesses and to the extent that you have income on one silo, you, can, you have to pay tax on it. To the extent that you have losses on other silos, you don't get to take that benefit. You can carry the loss forward, but you can only use that loss on income from that same um, business activity in the future. So since that came into play um, at, in late 2017, so for tax years beginning um, in 2018, we've had a couple of different pieces of legislation. So the first, um, we had a notice that came out in August of 18, basically saying in determining these trades or businesses, you could use a good faith interpretation of the rules, or you could use a six digit NIAC code. Um, they also start came out with some rules with respect to investments. Rules were good, but they left a lot to be desired. So this April, um, so in the midst of COVID, in the midst of the CARES Act, in the midst of everything else that was going on, uh, Treasury released some proposed regulations for us that provided additional clarity and guidance. They 
gave us a comment period of J June 23rd to submit comments. Um, and they've also indicated that they expect final regulations will be published this year. So by the end of this calendar year. So they really have fast tracked these and want to get information out to allow people to know how to treat unrelated business income. Until then, you can rely on the proposed regulations, you can rely on the notice, or you can just take a reasonable good faith interpretation of how to apply them. Um, it's only after we get the final regulations that those will be effective. So the proposed regulations, the biggest changes here, um, they're talking about using a two-digit NIAC code um, in determining trades or businesses. We'll, talk, we'll show that. Um, with investment income, there's some clarifications with respect to how you treat various investments. Um, and then with respect to the NOLs, there's some ordering rules that came into play. So with the proposed regulations, you would use two-digit NIAC codes in determining UBI that you conduct directly. So let's think about a hospital. If you have a reference lab and you have a pharmacy that you've treated as UBI, you would look at those activities and find the appropriate code. And then to the extent that you're using different codes, those would be treated as two separate silos. And then what are called non-qualifying partnership interests, those you would look through look at the activity that's being generated and treat that as um, in its appropriate silo. Then they say you can use separate silos, so you don't use the codes at all, but you have separate silos for your investments, for payments from controlled entities, like we talked about earlier, and then from um, non-qualifying S corporations. And I realize we're running kind of short on time here, so I'll um, continue through this, kind of keeping it pretty high level, um, but you do have the materials and you definitely can ask questions um, as we go or afterwards. So here's the, the new two-digit NIAC codes. They're very broad, um, 20 different ones to choose from. You look at them, you determine which is the best for your organization or your activity, and once you choose that code, you can't change it. Um, and it's important to know you can't just, a hospital can't look at code 62 and say, well, everything we do is healthcare, so we're just gonna use healthcare for all of them. Instead, you'd have to look at, you know, retail pharmacy would actually fall under either code 44 or 45 as retail trade. Um, your laboratory would be something different. If you have rental income, uh, that would be under 53 and would look different um, than all those other ones. So this is gonna take some work to go through and actually determine which of the codes are gonna apply for which of your activities. They do allow you to use one silo with respect to all of your investing activities. Um, to the extent that you have these qualifying investment partnerships and your debt finance property would all go in there together. Um, so I'm gonna touch quickly on how you get to that qualifying partnership interest because I think if we think about our alternative investments, most of these, I think, for most organizations are gonna fall under these qualifying partnership interests. So this is an interest a partnership where the exempt organization's not a managing member or a general partner, and it meets either a de minimis or a control test. Um, so we'll go through those two tests, but effectively what you're saying is, we don't have the ability to control this entity, therefore we can treat that income and the income from all of the partnerships that are QPIs as one trader business. Um, the same rules are applying to S corporations. I don't see many organizations investing in S corporations, primarily because the income from an S corporation, 100% of that is treated as taxable, regardless if it's 
being generated from interest or dividends or capital gains or losses, those exceptions don't apply to S corporation investments. So the two key tests here, the de minimis test, in this case, the you own no more than 2% of the profit interest or the capital interest. Um, so if you look at your K-1, you'll see what your ownership is in that partnership. And as long as it's less than 2%, you don't have to look any further into, the organ into this partnership to look at the trades or businesses. You can treat all of the income that's gonna be UBI as investment income. Um, the proposed regs did change that you don't have to look at related organizations interests in the same partnership, nor do you have to look across partnerships and look at their underlying investments. So if you were invested in um, two partnerships and both of those partnerships invested in a second tier partnership, you don't have to combine your, your ownership in that second tier partnership. So if you received a K-1, it says you own 1.5%, you're good. You don't have to do anything further. Let's say you own more than 2%, but you own less than 20%, then you may fall under the control test. And in that case, then you have to actually look at um, any interests that are owned by your supporting organizations or any controlled entities. And as long as you still get to that less than 20%, and you can meet these definitions to say that you don't have control, uh, then this, this is a qualifying partnership interest. And again, you don't have to look at the underlying activities and apply the siloing rules. So I know I went through that really quickly. Um, we, I will tell you, we do have a presentation that was done last month specifically on these rules. It's out on our website. Um, if you want more information on it, feel free to pull that up and listen to that presentation. And then I think this is our last polling question. So what does the acronym QSCI stand for? Qualifying S-Corp? Qualifying C Corp, qualifying S Corp investment, or qualifying S Corp interest? Ooh, this is a hard one. Since I this was the one slide I kind of skipped over. Good thing you don't have to have it right. But I'll give you the answer as soon as we. Back close it out and the answer was B it was qual oh I'm sorry it was qualifying it was D qualified S Corp interests all right then I again I apologize for going over here but I'll just talk through these other current issues on a very high level just to make sure everyone gets the information and again I'm happy to stay after and answer any questions I wanted to make sure everyone is aware of the section 4960 excise tax on excess compensation. So this also came into play with respect to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. And this applies a 21% tax on compensation in excess of a million dollars per person or on excess parachute payments that are paid to your covered employees. And it's important to know here, your covered employees have to be analyzed each year, and it's your top five um, employees that are based on their current year remuneration, but that compensation doesn't include payments for medical services. So in our healthcare system, we're gonna, we're gonna end up taking out a lot of our physicians because they're getting paid for medical services. So in most cases, you're going to be looking at any of your administrative people who are paid over this million dollars. The amount in excess of the million dollars is subject to this tax. Um, if you haven't been doing this, if you haven't 
analyzed who your covered employees are, you really need to do that and keep the documentation because once someone's a covered employee, so one of your top five, even if they're not over a million dollars, once they're a covered employee, they keep that label forever. So if they're paid 750,000 this year, but five years from now they get paid 1.2 million and they're not one of your top people then, they're still subject to this tax because they were a covered employee this year. So we did get proposed regulations on these um, rules in June, attempted to raise, answer some questions, they raised a lot more. Um, so a lot more to come on this and we will probably be doing a education seminar on the excess compensation rules um, in the near future. And then just quickly on the CARES Act developments, I wanna make sure everyone's aware of the payroll tax deferral um, this is available to all organizations, effectively allows you to, um, to defer paying your payroll taxes, your social security tax that's due between March 27th and December 31st. You can defer that 50% in 2021 and 50% in 2022. You will have to pay it in the future. Um, so this is not a savings, it's a deferral, and that's it. And then the employee retention credit. This is the other one that I think um, some organizations have taken advantage of. Some may not have thought through it yet, but this is a credit of 50% of qualifying wages, up to $5,000 credit per employee, and in order to get this, your business has to have been fully or partially suspended by a government order, or you have to have a reduction in your gross receipts of more than 50% compared to um, the same quarter in 2019. Um, and then once those gross receipts go up to 80%, you are no longer eligible. Now the definition of which wages qualify depends on what size organization you are. If you're over 100 employees, you can only get this credit for individuals that you continue to pay that were not providing any services. So they were furloughed um, or they, and, but you continue to pay them or even if you just continue to pay their benefits, um, that those benefits could be eligible for this um, credit. Now, one of the things that we've talked to a lot of healthcare organizations about is with respect to this fully or partially suspended. Um, and there has been some clarification that would say, even though most healthcare organizations were considered essential, so most of them were still operational, if you had a part of your operations that were suspended by a government order, so you were, there was a government order that said you could not perform elective surgeries for a certain period of time, you would be considered to meet this definition because you were partially suspended. So if you haven't thought through this, um, there's still an opportunity to take this credit um, I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone about it or get you in touch with someone um, who works in this area. But it, you know, it could provide you some opportunity if you had situations where you continue to pay people who weren't working during those time frames. And with that, we'll do our last polling question and then I will let you uh, go. So with the CARES Act, you can take a credit on payroll report. And since I didn't specifically say that, I'm gonna let you know it's true. So you do take these credits on your form 941 um, and you actually redu you reduce, um, well, I should say, you can actually take the credit by either not paying in the payroll tax that's due and then you reconcile it on your 941. So with that, um, I will open it up to questions. I do appreciate you sticking with me. Um, this was a lot of material to get through and I must have talked a little bit more than I um, normally had planned on talking. So 
Um, I do appreciate it, especially on a Friday afternoon that you stuck with me. Um, I'm happy to stay around for questions. Otherwise, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out with any additional questions. Thank you for participating and um, definitely stay tuned for more webinars on in our health systems um, presentation series. So thank you.